hope everybody's well. Is anyone familiar with Rigel Medical? Anyone heard of Marag Medical before? <laughs> well, there you go. Here's a, here's a bag for you. Um, so, <laughs> plenty of bags to go out. So we are a manufacturer based in the UK of biomedical test solutions, um, electrical safety analyzers, and uh, patient simulation, and that type of thing. We've got an office over in Tampa, in Florida, and I'm here today as the category manager of Rigel Medical to talk about making informed decisions of uh, testing medical devices. Now, what does that mean and what is that going to cover? Well, the talk is around metrology, the talk is around risk mitigation and quality management systems, and fundamentally, what a manufacturer puts in the service manual um, as a recommended test practice. So the equivalent mes message, what does that actually mean? OEMs, uh, our original equipment manufacturers, recommend test equipment in service manuals. And this needs to be understood. By definition, clinical engineers, biomedical engineers measure things. So metrologists um, and understanding the specification of a device under test is key. Nearly every medical device has some kind of specification, whether it be electrical, whether it be mechanical, a patient monitoring system will have a specification on accuracy because it's measuring stuff. So it's just being aware of, of what is being measured and understanding the equivalent message that is always hidden within a service manual. Um, but really what the presentation is, is about is having the freedom of choice in making the decision on the requirements that is provided from the manufacturer. So that's to evaluate specification, understand specification of a device, look for alternatives, demo equipment, very important. For me, demo and equipment actually is the, is the fun part because you, you've got different uh, manufacturers that have different preferences. But really, it's, it's understanding the user preferences and you know, making the, the correct decisions. So we're all familiar with maintenance, right, of, of medical devices to inhibit failures and look for inaccuracies. Part of risk management, without maintenance of medical devices, without maintenance of anything, there's a risk involved. Um, and if you have a PM schedule provided by your organization, whoever puts that together, and I'm going to go into a little bit of that later on, it's understanding what the uh, original equipment manufacturer might recommend and understanding what is required as a biomed to make sure they've got equipment that's fit for purpose. Um, just out of curiosity, who in the room follows a service manual from the manufacturer um, as the guidance? Let's say, for instance, uh, you pick up a, a service manual for uh, an infusion device, and it might say, well, you need X pressure meter. Would you follow the guidance of the straight from the manufacturer? Man, interesting. Inter I'll go into this later on. Yeah, well, the frequency is a different thing. You know, so that's also in the equation for evaluating risk, whether it's six months, 12 months, 24. And gathering the information and, and making your own decisions on testing periods is also part of this, this presentation. So are the alternatives to preventative maintenance? Well, yes, they are. There's alternative equipment uh, maintenance. Uh, if a patient care is not adversely affected, you can go and pretty much do your own thing as long as you have a risk uh, portfolio to provide whatever you're going to test. For instance, in university hospitals, you might follow the guidance of in-house testing. So you've got five different vendors of a patient monitor. You might collate this information and say, well, the best practice, there's a commonality here. You know, there's, we're doing the same test on this, we're doing the same test on that. 
will just consolidate and every patient monitoring system that comes through the system, this is how we are going to standardize our testing. But you must make sure that you've done a report uh, of your testing procedures to make sure that anything goes wrong, you've got evidence to prove that that, that was a correct decision. And this in some areas of the world is a, is a legal requirement. And if you develop an alternative equipment um, maintenance plan, well, it's the fundamentals of the job, evaluation of risk, hazard, the clinical need, the cost and the resource, um, because uh, all these things are evaluated when everybody is doing their job with as a biomed. Um, and just about planning and having an efficient way of working by developing this. I mean, there's no, I'm not advising that anyone should develop anything. I'm just giving you some indication into different ways and means of doing a job as a, as a biomed. Can be the better use of staff time, can give you more reliable data, can be better at mitigating risk, but equally it might not. But it's all about quality assurance and making sure that as a biomed or clinical engineer, you, you're doing the job that you're paid to do. Now here's some real world examples of a service manual and the contents within a service manual. So every R&D department, when they're going through your 60601-1 and your 60601-2 standards, to get this out to the marketplace, to put the CE mark on it or get through the FDA or whatever it might be, whatever regulatory requirement is, for me to have an idea as a manufacturer, think I want to put this medical device on the marketplace, you know, you've got to go through a robust testing procedure, but you also have to have, you know, written document documentation and uh, a service manual. Now within this service manual, it's giving you clear guidance what test equipment to use. Now, redacted, redacted, sorry, some of that information because I mean, you know, it's, we, we, we're not here to talk about Rigel or, or other competitors, but I'm just giving you an indication of. So I'll give you that. So we're familiar with this, right? We've seen this in many service manuals. As far as the specifications concerned, it will always give you the message to say or equivalent. So it'll give you a, a suggestion of a device it will say or equivalent on just about every service manual. So what does that mean? Really the equivalent message is that as long as it fits this specification, then you're good to go. So you don't really need to use the recommendation. All you need to do is evaluate that these, the specification and description written in the, the, the document, the table is, is fit for purpose and is like for like. That is what equivalent means. So you're not at the mercy of the OEM and their guidance. You, you have the freedom of choice as long. An example would be, and I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of uh, the com competitors and whatnot, because all of the specifications are the same with all, across all of the, uh, the biomedical test equipment. Um, the unique selling points are entirely different. If I was to say, if I was going to use a tool to measure the temperature in this room, I've got a good guess. You know, I estimate it's going to be about 22 degrees Celsius in Fahrenheit. What would that be? 72-ish. Uh, I've got a good guess. And then I could go back to the air conditioning and then I've, I've got the setting, but really what is the accuracy? How do I know what the accuracy is? Well, let's say, uh, okay, I wanted a really controlled environment and we're going to lock this place down so I had a really stable temperature. Well, how would I actually find out that's that stable and what would I measure? Well, I'd, I'd use a thermometer. But if I wanted 1% accuracy to, to make sure that the setting is correct, I'd have to buy a thermometer that guarantees 1% accuracy of the reading because that's the measurement that's being made. So I've got much choice in buying thermometers, I could buy a K-type thermometer, I could buy a thermistor thermometer, a, you know, all, a, a PT type of platinum resistor thermometer, infrared. I've got multiple options. They're all doing the same job, 
measuring temperature. As long as I get a one that is 1% accurate, accurate and better, then I'm good to measure that temperature. That's a slight analogy on any type of metrology, on any type of device, same thing. Rigel are in service manuals, so that's our, our tester, and we recommend that. Oh, the, sorry, the original equipment manufacturer recommends it, but this isn't about Rigel being better than anybody else, or, or, or so be it. What I'm trying to get over with this presentation is that it is a freedom of choice, and uh, you know it's it's up to you as an individual to evaluate these things, but understand the risk if you were to go down the route of making your own choice. Uh, the, the, as long as you understand the specification and the metrology, you're good. Has anyone heard of a high pot test, high potential test? Anybody? Sean? Yeah, all right. There's, uh, he's, he's a he's a bag. There you go. Oh well, Sean says he's a, <laughs> he doesn't count. He doesn't count. Well, another valuable or some valuable insight in uh, making informed decisions when buying test equipment. This is from a patient monitor, which I'll I'll rename uh, remain nameless on the on the brand. But part of its schedule, part of its preventative maintenance, is talking about high pot testing. Well, high pot testing is high potential. That's 4,000 volts or 1,500 volts. Has anybody in their workshop got a device that produces high voltage testing, AC or DC? I've only ever seen one hospital with this type of thing. The reason being that that is part of R&D, that's part of your 60601 test to make sure validation in worst condition scenarios. So the R&D team and the design team will put high voltages on electrical equipment to make sure the installation and the, the, the breakdown doesn't happen and it's safe to use in the worst uh, scenario. And it uses various different types and different fault conditions and all. This is guidance from IEC. Uh, so the service manual, the, the, the person that's wrote this, the R&D guy or the quality guy within the, um, within the company has taken the, the document literally in a service mode. Well, I'm not saying that's bad practice. I'm just saying that th this is a real unnecessary, this is looking for detrimental damage. You, you're really putting a voltage out there to find a destructive, or it's a destructive voltage to find a fault. It's unnecessary. It's not part of a uh, preventative maintenance schedule per se. So there's things like that in a service manual where you would make a decision, you would think, I don't need this stuff. This stuff's for R&D, it's not for service. And, you know, it's if you take your car into a garage, you're not gonna have a crash test dummy. Uh, I mean, that's that's the reality, and that's the, pretty much the equivalent to what this is. Um, so you would do uh, your, your NFP 99 or your 60601 or 62353. It does, not not Rigel, but our sister company Seawood, Seawood, Seawood Electronics. We we make a high pot tester, so we we are end to end uh, provider of test equipment for uh, many industries, and that's one of them. So I've got knowledge on that stuff. Uh, it also goes into um, you know your different parts of and different suggestions of all type of. Things, but I've really, I've really highlighted the the high pot test as a as a indication that it's not necessary. But you you would you would use your standard electrical safety test to do these things. And then I've got another one here, electrosurgical generator. Oh, okay, this one's slightly dated, but I mean, who has all the electrosurgical units in their facility? There's probably a lot of them. Um, so this one will break down the requirements straight from the standard. So the standard, your 60601-2 standards, it will say, oh, you need a voltmeter, you need a true RMS, 
uh, voltmeter, you need an oscilloscope, you need a, a current leakage tester, and you need a current coil, and you need a bunch of resistors. And before you know it, you've got a really complex setup. You think, well, how, how do I test this thing? Because the information that it's given us is quite literal. Um, the reality is that providers of test equipment like Rigel have all of this in one device, and that's an electrical safety, uh, sorry, an electrosurgical uh, analyzer. So we've put all of this in uh, one device, but the, the, the manual will still ask for, for individual parts. It's quite confusing. Um, and there's no real guidance on a manufacturer. There's no real guidance on a part number. You go, what it does is just gives you the individual components straight from the standard, and that's, re that's really confusing. But it's just having that understanding about what the test equipment does and watch the videos on YouTube and, and you know, Google and, and this type of thing. And you get a, a, a knowledge for, for some of the equipment that's out in the field. Yeah, yes, that's a good question. So uh, high frequency. AC, high frequency. There you go for your question. High frequency, uh, well, it's it's stuff that is, you need pure inductance to get the correct wattage readings. You can measure current, but if you measure current and voltage together, there might be a phase shift. So that phase shift will be, if you've got exaggerated capacitance and inductance in a system, then you're going to get different wattage readings. So they always specify low inductance resistors. A similar thing with wires, similar thing with um, leakage tests for, for these things. You should do it on a wooden desk. You should use short cables. If you use a long cable, by, by definition, you've got capacitance. So it's, it's that type of recommendation. So quality management, why am I talking about quality management systems? Because they're very important in healthcare and they're very important within a clinical uh, or biomedical department situation, because what you see in your department is better than the other department in, in what you do. You're providing the, the policies and the procedures to make sure that the work that your colleagues are doing, your department's doing, is uh, above standard. So uh, for the purposes of you know, overall better patient care, we have ISO 9001. Well, ISO 9001 is generic for all companies. In the medical world, we have ISO 13485, and that's that's for the design and development, but it's also for, and it's suitable to be used in a health technology uh, management environment. Just so, anyone familiar with that? Anyone got a ISO in their department? ISO, like a quality management ISO in your department? Yeah, no, I mean, it's interesting. Some some do. Some uh, rough estimate would be 25% do, 75% don't. But it just gives, it, I think globally, it is a seal of approval to you uh, dotting your I's and crossing your T's. And they're not expensive, really, to uh, to implement. It's just a, an extra quality package to, to your performance. And then there's risk management. Well, there's another ISO standard for that. That's ISO 14971. Uh, Anyone familiar with that? that it's, a, it's another thing that is being embedded into biomedical world. And really that's just, a, it's all about risk. Every, every decision that you make is, is about risk. And there's things called residual risk that you kind of get a, a away from. There's, areas within science and there's areas within clinical engineering where you just have to accept the risk. Or you could, if, I, if you're a manager within a biomedical department, you could just transfer the risk. So let's say you've got, I saw some of the, has anyone seen that? Um, I don't know if you've been around the show yet, but have you seen the college that has the, the virtual reality and you can, you can do an MRI machine and you can do these very, expensive machines in theory without getting your hands dirty and without replacing a PCB that might be $30,000 that you damage and then you know 
you're going to have a very cheesed off boss because you that in reality i might not want to if i'm mitigating risk in that type of scenario i might want to just transfer the risk to another vendor he's looking after that or that, that company is looking after that and anything goes wrong well them are the, you know the litigation is on them not on us so that, that's just another element of how you manage risk within a health technology management system because the, the, the quality management systems and and risk management are interlinked in in how things are done and then going back to some of the international standards well you shouldn't really follow these like for like because International standards are for the design and, man and manufacturing of a medical device. So you might get something in a standard that will state, well, plus or minus three joules, plus or minus 15 uh, percent to output the, 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 the energy from a DFib. Well, that's just guidance. That's best practice. Some are more accurate than that. Some are not so accurate as that. As, you, as long as you can prove that you can stop a heart in a various condition, it doesn't really matter. So it's just all about the, the best practice, really. Uh, but I mean, of course, you're going to follow that. Uh, so if you were looking at a, a solution to measure DFib, where you wouldn't follow IEC standards, you would, fo you would follow the specification of the, of the DFib or the automatic external DFib under test. They all have specification, it's just known the best practice and how to tackle that. So this, the standards don't define specialist equipment. You do need dedicated analyzers. The, the dedicated analyzers do the job for you. Uh, and again, it's a, it's a risk mitigating factor to have that type of specialist equipment. Um, this, is, this does not necessarily have to be the, t the, the test tool recommended by the OEM, as I've stressed, it could be as long as I have the same parameters, as long as you're measuring what is in your preventative maintenance schedule, then you're covered, really. Um, and this is applicable when testing all medical devices in a, in a department. It's, we, I keep saying the same thing, specification, and making sure that you fit for purpose. And there is certain procedures to follow that I'll go into a best, pra uh, best practice in accuracy and what's safe. Um, because of multiple factors that affect safety and accuracy, you know, the wear and tear, high stress, uh, environments, the quality of the products. Anyone that looks at the FDA website or you know, MHRA or whatever it might be, whatever country you're in, you'll notice that medical devices fail. It's the nature of the beast. Some might say, uh, you know, you, I've done an electrical safety test on this device multiple times. It's passed every single time. What's the purpose of doing this thing? What is the actual purpose of, of doing a performance test? Well, things fail. ICs in components in medical devices fail. I mean, there's evidence to back that up. I always cite these things. What would happen? Would you get on an airplane if they stopped testing airplanes? Probably not. So would you put your relative in a position that and you know that the medical device wasn't being tested on? Probably not. So it's just to stress these, these type of environments and the importance of the accuracy and testing uh, the safety of a device. And this is part of your, reg your schedule maintenance and your performance uh, ver verification of a device and, of course, the, the safety test. So it's really important that when you're choosing the right biomedical test tool, all of these uh, areas become really evident. Uh, both safety and performance verification can really streamline things. If you get the right practice, if you get the right workflow, it's, again, it's freedom of choice. What works for you? What works for your department? If it's portable device, if you're doing a lot of traveling, let's say you, you're going to local clinics, well, you don't want to be carrying around a you know, a 30 pound bit of equipment, you want something that's, that's going to be relatively portable that you can put in a backpack. Um, can you develop these things? Yes, by evaluation and looking at the products. And it takes a lot of work, upfront work, to, to 
put together an alternative preventment, uh, preventative maintenance schedule, but it can be the best way of doing things. Um, this is more about the, the preventative maintenance, and it is the simplest way just to follow the, the manufacturer's guidance. There's no doubt about it, uh, but this is more just giving you a, a little bit more in, uh, insight into uh, what if you do this and what if you do that, and is there a clear benefit? And then the alternative maintenance schedule, uh, and there's benefits of doing that. Like effectively, it is that increase in efficiency. As I said before, you might want to consolidate testing rather than having multiple different, following a guide that is, I need to get this guide out, I need to get that service manual out. If you just consolidate and you make sure that you've mitigated the risk when consolidating, you can speed things up uh, with the right test tools. There is disadvantages to do this because you do need expertise, you know, people that are knowledgeable with metrology and risk management, and it might be an upfront initial resource because you're putting a lot of energy in this and you want the return on, on that investment. Um, you need to document these things and thorough planning to execute whatever is re required. And then there's a little bit of a workflow if you wanted to develop this alternative equipment uh, maintenance schedule uh, and you can plan that out and it's really just about these intervals stressed before the, the frequency that can be manipulated you could I mean even in the world of calibration so uh, Alaris test tools have you seen the, the spaces that are used sometimes to guarantee that there's you know the infusion devices are done these are lumps of metal slightly on a different tangent, it's not a medical device, it's a test device. How often should you get a bit of metal calibrated that's got a diameter and a length? Well, it's recommended that you should calibrate it every year, but is, in the reality, is a lump of metal gonna change diameter in, in a five year period in a 10, probably not. So it's a waste of budget and energy and it's, it's just having this rationale about you know, making the, the informed decision about how you spend your money and your time on, on certain processes. Uh, and of course, you've got the asset management tools that track this stuff with the history of your inventory and, your, and help them identify to mitigate risk. And the medical device tests, you know, they're collating this stuff and making sure that you've got the, the correct maintenance schedules is, is really important. And having that repeated accuracy uh, of measurement just to ensure that you've got a good practice in place really. Um, does anyone save um, test reports? So let's say if you're doing a electrical safety test, is it a pass or a fail or do you record all the results? What would you do? Would you collect the data from a, a test device and then port that over to your asset management software? Or would you just say it's pass or refill? You record it? No, I mean, that's really interesting because uh, I ask this question quite often and there might be 80% of the, the audience might say, well, just pass or refill. We, we don't bother with. Now, th these things are changing, and the reason why they're changing is because it's becoming much more important to make sure you've got the results, to make sure that you've got that quality process for, you know, risk of, of, of litigation. Yeah, exactly. That's a really good point. I mean, how how would you prove the accountability? I mean, it's very difficult with a pass or a fill. Is, the, most instruments, the regular instruments, are all self-contained. All the results are in the device in a database. You kind of change the things once you've and once you've ported that over to your database as a PDF, um, and that's captured. That, that just keeps you uh, really on the straight and narrow to make sure we've got a quality process. We record now our results. If anything goes wrong, well, I've got proof that at this period of time, 
of timestamp that they're safe, it's safe to use. And this is where I'm a real nerd because I do like metrology and I am, my background is, I was a service guy at one point and then I went in the ugly world of commercial and, and sales and stuff. But I, at heart, really, um, I am a, a service nerd and I do love metrology and going into the nitty gritty of, of best practice test accuracy, accuracy ratio. So what does that actually mean? Well, you have NIST and then you have National Physical Laboratories and there's a lab somewhere that knows exactly the measurement of a yard, knows exactly the measurement of a volt, knows exactly the, to a certain degree, you know, what, ha what happens? Does anyone know what actually happens internationally? Internationally, does anyone know how you prove one volt is one volt? Yeah, the sta the standards and there's there's you know there's there's ways and means of proven by measure and voltage, but how they actually put the the standard together when they decide people get together and decide the measurement of one volt, and it's not you know uh, millions of uh, columns going through a one ohm resistor and all this stuff. It's every country has a battery, a one volt battery, and they all get together and have a jolly and a drink and all this stuff, a bit like what we're doing today. And then they'll measure it and then they'll decide, oh, this is this is the one volt. So all these international people get together. Anyway, that's just a little bit. Of, uh, you're, measuring, you're measuring it with, uh, with a standard, um, like a standard multimeter. And they, they just decide that they've kind of collated all this data and then the standard, it's the battery, it's the source really rather than the measurement technique. Um, anyway, there's a little bit of uh, information. So what does this mean? It means, like, let's say a scenario, when we talk about best practices and reality are two different things. Because if I, if I say, uh, if I use ratios, this might be, all right, slightly exaggerated, but let's say this is a NIBP monitor and the manufacturer has specified that any pressure that this is measuring from a patient is 1% accurate. So yeah, 300 millimeters of mercury is, is either 303 or um, 297. So how do you prove that? Well, you can get another pressure meter and pump it up and verify and compare against each other. But the pressure meter, pressure meter that you're using as a standard needs to be better than the equipment under test. That, so that's the first fundamental. But some of the risk, it, it's not necessarily true sometimes because you can use a one-to-one -one as long as you understand the risk. You can refer against previous calibration uh, certificates and say, well, the last time I got this calibrated, actually, it was quite accurate. So th there is weird. You should never go beyond the, the ratio. You should never have a scenario where you've got a 2% uh, monitor. I did see in some environments, in some biomed shops uh, in the UK, where they're doing uh, infant incubator analyze, uh, infant incubator test. So you've got to measure temperature, you've got to measure humidity, you've got to measure sound, and all of these other things, other parameters. Well, the guidance is to measure temperature and have a suitable thermometer to measure temperature. Yet when I was going to these places, I was finding out that they were using K-type thermometers. Now, anyone know what a K-type thermometer is? K-type thermometer. Yeah, exactly. So it's it's looking at two compound, two alloys of metal, and then there's a voltage it, that it, is a differential. So it's looking at two. It creates a tiny, tiny voltage that's proportional. To what the temperature is, and it measures that, right? But a K-type thermometer and thermocouples are highly inaccurate. You know, you're never going to get anywhere down to three percent, uh, and the range is huge. And you might get a K-type. The range is minus 200 degrees Celsius to, you know, uh, 1,000 degrees Celsius. And but infant incubators, infant incubators, uh, 
you're checking it, you know, 40 degrees Celsius and, and 37 degrees Celsius. And sorry, I should be converting that to Fahrenheit. I, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, the airflow is part, so you have an anometer too to measure the airflow in some, I mean, in some guidance says that, some, some doesn't. But you should have, you, you, you map it. Technically, you would have five different points, 10 centimeters above the bed, uh, and then you would, as long as it's within uh, a range, I mean, I'm using an example of, uh, of NIBP, but where I was going to go with the, the test tool is people are using highly inaccurate thermometers to measure something that is relatively precise. So the Draga, for instance, might be plus or minus 0.8 degrees Celsius. Now that's really tight. You know, it's a really tight specimen. So if you're using a K-type thermometer, really what you're doing is you're using the, the in, infant incubator as a source to calibrate the thermometer. It's the other way around. So uh, this is where things are really important. These are best practice. Reality, it's going to be very expensive to go, you know, 10 times the factor. So this might be an NIBP. This might be a pressure meter. Then you might have another internal source. And then this will go back to the calibration house. And then this will go back to national standards. And, you know, so there is uh, some rationale. In practice and in reality, nobody really does this because it's just too expensive to, to have this this times 10 type of uh, test accuracy ratio. So this is where the really three, uh, four to one, three to one is, is more applicable. And then specsmanship, well, it's always my favorite subject, uh, particularly with when you're looking at measurement many devices will go way above the relevant need for measurement and they will do this to have an advantage in the marketplace or competitive advantage and i think it's a well it's a lot of crap i mean effectively because if you wanted to measure a, a good example really would be if you wanted to measure ground continuity on a ground bond test well, the pass fail thresholds for that, a 0.1 of a norm, a 0.2 of a norm, a 0.3 of a norm, very, very small. So why do you need to be measuring 20 ohms? Why do you need to be measuring 50 ohms? Some, some, that's way beyond what the safe limits are. So this specsmanship really is, there's something that you just need to appreciate. It's not, it doesn't mean that the instrument is better. It's a similar thing with accuracy, you know, but I mean, align, most of the, uh, the competitors with RIGEL, the, the, the specification is aligned. It's kind of like standardized, but the range of measurement perhaps isn't. And I wouldn't get too exorbitant by it. I would ignore it really. Uh, it doesn't mean one iota difference when, you, when you're doing your testing. And just to summarize, really, you can form alternative tests uh, maintenance and you can look at alternative test tools that is recommended in a service manual there's nothing wrong with doing that um, any device should be treated the same as long as the you've got those characteristics as I've explained in the in the presentation and really I mean you want to just provide that better evidence with accuracy data because you're just having a better experience within the workplace, really. Um, and it is about choice. And there's huge demands on medical um, engineers, biomedical engineers, and the test equipment needs to be understood on what decisions you would need to evaluate to make the, a purchase of a product. I mean, 80% price, probably half of the time. Um, but accuracy, precision, and fun, it's just getting a, an understanding of these things. And, and I, I really love that side of, uh, of, the, of the job when, when I was doing the, the service stuff. So, you know, needless to say, um, over specified ranges, limits, functions, 
just understanding the application of what is actually being done, what's being measured here. You know, why use a, a thermometer that has a huge range when you're only interested in a couple of degree shift in a parameter, you, you, there's no need. Um, another example actually that I've seen is pressure, where somebody might use a 20 bar pressure meter to measure uh, an, like a ventilator machine. And the ventilator is very, very low pressure, but you've got this huge measurement. And if you think, well, 20 bar and you've got 1% full scale of 20 bar, that, that's a huge specification. And you're only looking at something very small. And I've seen that a, a few times. Sorry, I'll keep going off on a tangent with these things that I, that I, that I find out. In the, it's just frustrating. Can you feel the frustration? Our, yeah, RF is an important factor um, when, because you, you effectively with a electrosurgical unit, it's a it's a radio antenna. It's a radio antenna. If I was to, you know, just have an open circuit, and I was to press the pen and the, the Bovey pencil of a electrical surgical unit. I'm emitting radio frequencies, and that's going to have a detrimental. These are again. I go back to the national standards. These are within safe national standards of EMC and all of this stuff. But things can cause interference. Now, I've never seen the Rigel test to go off because it's got suitable shielding, and part of us being a manufacturer and the, the competitors, you have to put these things through. I was just I was just about to tell that, that off. I didn't. Um, yeah, so the, the, you still have to go through a rigorous process called IEC 61010, and that would prevent any type of it's EMC tested effectively at radio frequencies. Um, anyway, where was our? Yep. So I mean, freedom of choice does not. When you're looking at specification, you're looking at the medical device, these things necessarily don't correlate with the, the advice that it's coming from the, the service manual. And when you assess these things, you can use a very simple method of assessing it, uh, where you're asking yourself questions and you're giving yourself a likeliness reading. Um, and that's something that I've seen some hospitals. It's very like a risk matrix, effectively. But the choice is ultimately down to uh, preference and fit for purpose uh, of, of any device. I mean, it's similar to choosing you know, anything that you want to choose in, in life. It's all how it fits into your workflow. And as a department can decide, uh, they can decide on any product. I mean, that's as long as it fits the needs within the budget requirements and, and whatnot. But all that stuff goes without saying, really. Um, and that is the end of the presentation. Uh, hopefully you got something for that. Thank you very much.